Hi, everybody. <clears throat> So I have the misfortune of being all that's standing between you and cocktail hour. Um, I want to get to the questions, um, and I lost about 10 minutes there, so I'm gonna try to go pretty quickly through my presentation. So this is about um, the next generation of, of, of potential employees and people you're probably already working with today. Now, why am I talking about this? I am a constitutional lawyer. I have been the, uh, the head of FIRE for about 23 of its 25 years of existing. FIRE is the foundation for individual rights uh, and expression. We defend freedom of speech, both on and off campus. Um, so wh what, do I, wh what do I know about this particular topic? Well, I wrote a book and an article called Coddling of the American Mind with my good friend Jonathan Haidt, um, who's a pretty well-known social psychologist. And in the course, after that came out in 2018, we started being contacted by employers all over the country telling them that everything you said in your book is accurate and we're having real problems with the new hires we're getting from college, uh, the people who started graduating around 2016, 2017, 2018, and particularly for the hires we're getting from colleges. Um, and one of the, the stories I was told was someone I know who actually runs a nonprofit like I do uh, that does direct services for indigent and homeless people said that her organization was essentially shut down by the new hires because relatively small negative interactions between students were sh was shutting down the organization for days. Every small incident became something for human resources. And then next thing you know, the, uh, the function of actually helping poor people and homeless people became secondary um, to inter-office drama. And I even heard from some Fortune 500 presidents who said that they had stopped hiring from uh, elite colleges. And of course, since I would like to see reforms at some of the colleges, my immediate response was, okay, um, could you tell the world that you're not doing that anymore? And the, uh, to a man, they all answered no. They didn't actually want the bad press of being the one who weren't hiring from those places anymore. Um, and that's, I believe that's starting to change to some degree. So weirdly enough, this whole story starts with me uh, recovering from a suicidal depression in Philadelphia in 2007. Now, what does this have to do with anything? Well, when I started recovering from depression, and I had suffered from depression my entire life, but it only got really bad by being involved in the culture war all day long in 2007 as, as the new president of FIRE, I started studying something called cognitive behavioral therapy. How, how many people are familiar with this? Raise your hand. Okay, so cognitive behavioral therapy is actually the embodiment of a lot of ancient wisdom. It essentially tells you to talk back to the voices in your head that tell you that everything's gonna be catastrophic, that everyone's against you, that, that you're basically set up to uh, boom. Uh, and this is an amazing insight that once you actually get in the habit of talking back to these voices in your own head, uh, it is the most effective treatment for anxiety and depression we know of. And that includes, in many cases, drugs. Um, it absolutely changed my life, absolutely saved my life. And meanwhile, since I was working a lot on college campuses, I was looking at college campuses and saying, wow, it's kind of like the adults are telling young people, do catastrophize, do engage in mind reading, do engage in binary thinking, engage in all these ways of thinking that will make you anxious and depressed. But at least in 2008, when I was studying this, I said to myself, thank goodness the students weren't uh, actually listening. They were you know, rolling their eyes at the adults like they always had been. So I wrote the initial article with Jonathan Haidt in 2015, uh, making the argument, uh, be, and it's because we started noticing right around 2014 that students started showing up on campuses uh, demanding that uh, professors be punished, that students be punished, that there be new speech codes on college campuses. Uh, and they all rationalized it through this kind of medicalized jargon that looked to my eye very much like cognitive distortions, like the kind of thinking that will make you anxious and depressed if you actually believe it. 
And this is something we started working on in 2014, saying that we're about to see a big problem, not just for free speech and academic freedom on campus, but for mental health among young people, period. Um, so we, this is what we saw in 2015, uh, that's what we published in The Atlantic. Uh, wrote a book uh, called Coddling the American Mind, which came out in 2018. Um, it definitely touched a nerve because it's sold almost 700,000 copies at this point. Um, and, you know, we called it a day because we fixed the problem. Actually, unfortunately, everything was just about to get much worse. Um, and what we tried to distill was the kind of bad advice we felt like we were giving to a generation of people. Um, and so the first two uh, we, we call, uh, so imagine like the worst guru you could possibly go to. And the first, uh, the untruth of fragility. What doesn't kill you makes you weaker. Terrible advice goes against modern psychology and against ancient wisdom. Always trust your feelings. Sounds cute, terrible advice. <clears throat> but for today, the most important piece of advice is people who believe the untruth of us versus them. Life is a battle between good people and evil people. And I'm gonna be coming back to the great untruth number three a lot. Because for most of my life, my dad's Russian, uh, we, we escaped the Bolsheviks, um, I very much believe the words of Solzhenitsyn, one of the great Russian dissidents, that the path of good, through, uh, good and evil uh, crosses through the heart of every man. That essentially, being morally sophisticated meant Let's admit it, We're, we all have good and evil inside of us. We all can be good, we can all be angels, we can all be devils. Uh, people are complex. And when it comes to talent, we all know from personal experience, some of the brightest people and the most talented people you ever met in your life are not necessarily the easiest people. And some people who are very, very nice are not necessarily the best employees. So if you find someone, um, that you're interested in hiring, and they very much believe in the third great untruth, they might actually uh, be preventing you from hiring the best potential talent out there, because oftentimes, talent is eccentric. And unfortunately, um, when it came to the prediction about the mental health of y young people uh, turning south, we unfortunately were much more right than we um, imagined. We've seen a 145% increase in major depression among girls um, and 161% incre uh, increase for boys. My co-author, <coughs> co Jonathan Hyde, is actually coming out with a book in March that goes deeper into this, but what we thought would be a little scholarly increase in anxiety and depression has actually turned into something more like a tsunami. So, my most recent book, which came out in October, is actually about cancel culture. Now, why did I decide to use such a controversial term like cancel culture? Actually, probably some of you don't even realize it's that controversial. The reason why I decided to use it was because when we did the polling, it actually turns out that most Americans, a Republican, Democrat, black or white, know what cancel culture is, and they're afraid of it. They don't want to get canceled. So we have a very simple definition of it, which is the uptick beginning around 2014 and accelerating 2017 of uh, campaigns to get people fired, disinvited, deplatformed, or otherwise punished for speech that would be protected under the First Amendment. And by that we mean as an analogy to public employee law. I am a First Amendment lawyer, so I could explain you know, in more detail in questions like what that actually means. And unfortunately, something big really did change right around the same time it was changing on campus, uh, changing in the larger society. And just to give you an example of how bad it's gotten on campus, these are how many attempts we've seen um, of attempts to get professors fired uh, in, in the recent past or otherwise punished. We don't have a comparison to this. We're talking about uh, more than 1,000 attempts to get professors fired just in the last nine years. About two-thirds of them are successful. Um, almost 200 of them actually fired, and while that may not necessarily sound like a huge number to you, keep in mind that the standard estimates of the Red Scare, McCarthyism, is about 100 professors were, were fired for that. So something bad it, it, it has been going on on campuses, and it's wildly concentrated at elite colleges. Wildly so. The graph for, for uh, sh showing how, mu how much worse this is in the top 10 colleges in the country is absolutely staggering. And it does have a human cost. As you know, the uh, problem of depression is something that is very close to my heart. And this is my uh, very conservative friend, Mike Adams, who killed himself after being canceled in 2020. Um, it can have a very real uh, human cost. So it is something to take seriously. It can lead to something that even though a lot of people think it comes from a good place, it can be a justification for very nasty behavior against people in the real world. 
So, uh, and just to give another comparison of how bad it's gotten, um, after 9-11, which is a better comparison because uh, the law during the time of McCarthyism was not actually clearly protective of freedom of speech, um, only about three professors were fired uh, for speech related to 9-11 or the Iraq War, and it actually turned out that pretty much all of them were fired for reasons that could be justified even under the First Amendment. Um, like I said, we're talking about closer to 200 uh, at a time when professors' uh, free speech and academic freedom rights are supposed to be strongly protected. So cancel culture is real, it is serious, it's happening on a historic scale, and its locus seems to be in higher education. And I think this has really important ramifications for employers. I'm, I'm an employer myself. FIRE uh, is a, now a $36 million organization. We employ about 120 people, um, and you do have to be careful. Uh, as, we all, uh, as we've all learned, one bad employee can cost you as much time as 20 good ones can save you. So how to keep your business out of the culture war? I talk a lot about this in Canceling of the American Mind. I wrote something about, uh, with Jonathan Haidt about it. Um, and these are the basic steps. <laughs> First one is, don't hire a canceler. Try to figure out if you're hiring someone who believes that life is a battle between good people and evil people. There are easy ways to kind of get at this question. And if you get the impression that essentially this is someone who thinks it's their way or the highway, a malady, by the way, much more common among elite, hi uh, 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 elite college graduates, um, don't hire them. Uh, it, it's, it's going to mean that, it, let's say you have, you know, a, a IT person who's the best in class, sometimes, uh, you know, my, my, it, it, what I've actually seen in some of these situations, finding out that someone they work with is a Trump voter was enough to lead to a full-on, you know, staff revolt in some of these institutions. And meanwhile, I think that you'd be denying yourself a tremendous amount of talent if you're willing to actually hire, a, a, regardless of political viewpoint. Um, and I wanted to give an example of some of the talent that uh, major institutions have lost due to cancel culture. Uh, this is Carol Hooven. Um, and she is an evolutionary biologist. She's top of her field, and she left Harvard after, in, an, uh, in a book review, in an interview about her book Testosterone, made the point that when it comes to uh, when it comes to trans issues, that we should be as kind and compassionate as possible, we should use trans people's pronouns, but we can't pretend biological sex is not real. She was forced out of Harvard. Nicholas Christakis. Nicholas Christakis is, you might remember him from 2015. He is a, uh, he has a PhD in statistics and a medical uh, degree. Uh, and he was this, the professor who was surrounded by students in 2015 at Yale, being told he was disgusting because his uh, wife uh, published something saying that students should be able to decide for themselves what Halloween costumes they wear. Um, this is, uh, he, he is a mental giant, and he was forced out of the Silliman uh, dorms. He did actually keep his job, but his wife did not. Roland Fryer. Um, I, I, has anybody heard of Roland Fryer? Raise your hand if you have. Okay, so Roland Fryer um, is exactly uh, the kind of diverse hire you want. He comes from legitimately uh, impoverished background. Like, he's from Florida. Uh, the people like he, he grew up with are all either dead or in jail at, um, now because they were arrested for dealing crack. He, grew, he had real world experiences that affected what he wanted to do with his life. And he got into Harvard as an economist. He's off the charts smart. But once he published something uh, rigorously done indicating that, yeah, there is a problem with police shootings and there's a problem with police mistreatment. But according to the in-depth research he did, while the problem, uh, there was a racial bias in uh, police mishandling of individual, uh, of minorities uh, when they were in interacting with them, it wasn't as clear that there was actually a, a police um, were disproportionately targeting uh, 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 unarmed black men. And this was not a popular view to have, but it was not his view, it's what he actually found. And next thing you know, he was being investigated for several years for apparently jokes he had made, I think at a Thanksgiving party. Uh, Barry Weiss, you know, uh, forced out of the New York Times, has now actually established her own media empire. Like, that's real talent um, that they could have kept. 
James Gunn, I think, is one of the most spectacular ones. Um, James Gunn, if, if you guys know the Marvel Universe or ever saw Guardians of the Galaxy, he is the talent behind those movies. He got canceled in around 2017 when old photos of him came out from a Halloween party in like 2003, and apparently his costume was a little bit, a bit obnoxious. Um, and he lost his job at, at Marvel, immediately creating an opportunity for DC uh, uh, Comics to, to hire him to recreate the entire DC universe. Now, I, I find this one particularly intriguing because it cost Marvel one of their best directors. They eventually got him back for the last couple movies, but basically created a huge opportunity for DC. So I, I think sometimes if someone were to set up a firm where basically they hired mostly people who got canceled, they'd be able to get some incredibly great talent. So, and Fran Itkoff. Um, this is a woman who was recently uh, suspended and fired from her volunteer work at the Multiple Sclerosis Society because she got confused as to why people had pronouns in their bios. She didn't understand it, but apparently this was sufficiently uh, confusing for her that they decided they had to get rid of her. And to say the least, this has been a public relations disaster for that charity. So, step two. Expand your definition of diversity. I always try to make this point um, that essentially I think that groups that know that having regional diversity, having class diversity, having disability diversity, um, like all of these things are kinds of diversity that often get overlooked and can actually really give your company an advantage um, in, in the modern marketplace. Um, when it comes to a lot of elite college graduates, you end up having, you, you may get superficial diversity, but in a lot of cases you're getting people who think uh, very much alike. Whereas hiring internationally for that, uh, for that matter, or hiring from other parts of the country, uh, you might actually get people who productively disagree with each other and know how to do that. Uh, reconsider what college you hire from. Now, uh, when it comes to University of Florida, one of the things I've heard is that uh, in, in, there are companies actually prefer to hire from University of Florida, as opposed to um, a lot of the uh, Ivy League schools these days, partially for all the reasons I laid out. And I do think that there are huge, there's a tremendous amount of talent that is actually no longer even applying to those schools because they realize that they, they're sending a better signal to employers if they go to a big state school than if they go to one of these places where, uh, that have had all these problems with tolerance of people they disagree with. Um, orientation, orientation hiring should stress institutional political neutrality and diversity of, of, of uh, point of view. Uh, Coinbase did this uh, a couple of years ago. They decided, when they were being asked to comment on a lot of political issues, Coinbase actually took a stand saying, no, we're business. We are not a group that actually has to have an opinion on everything that happens in the world. We're not going to do that. We want to do business with everybody. And what the uh, Brian Armstrong did is he said, listen, and if you're expecting me to make statements on these issues, I have a, uh, I have a package I can give you, a severance package I can give you to, to leave. 5% of his company left uh, a after that. But I do think that a lot of companies setting this up as an expectation going in can save you a lot of headaches um, in the long run. Uh, be careful who you for HR, if you end up uh, having a human resources person who actually believes that life is a battle between good people and evil people, that can be a problem for you. Survey employees to see if there's a problem. Um, th there's a, a very funny but if unfortunately named term called psychological safety. Um, now psychological safety is nothing like the safety we talk about in Coddling of the American Mind. What psychological safety means is can you disagree with each other in the workplace? Can you actually, is your boss going to fire you if you're wrong about something? Um, and apparently, uh, businesses that have a high level of psychological safety uh, thrive. And this isn't surprising. I'm constantly asking my employees to disagree with me. I, I remember what, I had an assistant, uh, her name was Bridget. And it had to be explained to her by my new COO that when I asked her opinion, that she was expected to actually give me her my honest, uh, to, to give me her honest opinion. I was expecting her to disagree with me. And this is one of the tricks to with it, differentiate good businesses from bad ones: is can people disagree with the boss? And of course, you know, if you're a boss who can't be disagreed with, you know, you got to work on that. Um, if a and if there's a social media firestorm, if suddenly someone's decided that they want you. To of your IT person because of something they tweeted. Um, this is one of those things where the best way to deal with it in a lot of cases is 
up a policy that says that when these kind of incidents happen, we don't take immediate action, that we have a two-week period before we'll even launch the investigation. And here's the thing. Twitter mobs, social media mobs, have very short uh, attention spans. They tend to fizzle very quickly. It will feel like the world is ending for three days. And then four or five days, they move on to something else. So if it really was important, and, you, and your employee really did do something that you think was worth firing, it will still look that way in two weeks. But don't immediately assume, because of the, uh, the, the, the impression that suddenly the world is exploding, uh, because one of your employees you know, cracked a joke on Twitter, that it's going to stay that way, because it almost never does. And as I said, don't make firing a, a first or preferred punishment. I do think that in a lot of cases, people can get, uh, can lose great talent by reacting too quickly uh, to the whims of a very fickle uh, social media mob. And of course, the question is, ask yourself at the end. Um, I think Google Gemini, if anybody has tried to do searches on that and found that, for example, when you ask it if whether Hitler or Elon Musk is more evil, getting the answer that it's a tough call <laughs> um, is an example of groupthink really potentially uh, damaging a, uh, a once great brand to the tune of billions of dollars. It is, it is a genuine calamity, and that's one of the problems with groupthink, why you actually want to have an organization that has psychological safety, that has people who come from different political viewpoints and know that they can disagree with each other productively and they're not gonna be fired if they do it in a way that, that occasionally ruffles some feathers. So I was able to do it and I have about uh, 18 minutes for questions. Thanks for having me. Okay, <laughs> that's more like, I'm like, jeez, nothing. Greg, thanks for coming out and, you know, exciting topic to discuss. Can you talk about the trends? I mean, we saw the graph that you showed, but can you talk about trends in colleges, especially like, let's say, state universities? Is the cancel culture, is it getting better or worse? Is it different somehow? And what's your forecast going forward? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I am wondering, like, a this is coming through, right? Like the, the uh, it, it seems to move around a little bit. Um, yes. So the question is, what uh, are we seeing about trends about big state colleges and other schools? Now, uh, one thing that was great for me that came out of Camp Coddling of the American Mind was it uh, allowed me to justify fire having a large research department, so we could really look into this stuff with great rigor. And we now do a campus free speech ranking. Um, that involves the largest survey of student opinion ever done. And, it, and it's been that way for four years now because it keeps on getting bigger. The largest database of professor cancellations, student cancellations, speech codes on campuses, and deplatforming. And we combine them all together to give every school a ranking. Now, has, has anybody heard that Harvard um, finished dead last in the campus free speech ranking? <laughs> That's oftentimes kind of like how people have heard of fire these days. Uh, and boy, did Harvard earn that. Um, it was very funny to have some Harvard um, uh, pe people um, initially act like, oh, this is just some kind of publicity stunt, um, and then question the methodology without actually looking into it, uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to the Wall Street Journal um, audience about how good our methodology actually was. And pretty soon, Nate Silver was actually citing our research and uh, how, how high quality it was. So when it comes to what that's shown us, um, Michigan Technological University um, finished first. A lot of the technological universities did a lot better on free speech. Why? Because I, I think when it comes to science, I think it's a lot harder to be dogmatic in the sciences. Um, when it comes to elite schools that actually did pretty well, University of Virginia finished in the top 10, only elite school that did that. Um, and, University, and uh, University of Chicago finished 13th. Now, the, the scale of the, of the survey is 248 schools, actually 260, but some of those schools are schools that don't promise free speech in the first place. We call those warning schools. But for the most part, elite colleges do the worst. 
although Dartmouth is trying. Um, it, it definitely seems to be the case that they're trying to get their game together. But larger state schools do much better. And my hope is that there has been such bad press about the behavior of elite higher education in the recent past that I think there are going to be lots of employers looking a lot more at the bigger state schools for, for hiring. Um, and this is entirely uh, something that elite higher education brought upon itself. Meanwhile, I refer to this as the silver spoon rule, that Harvard can never ever admit that it's done anything wrong. Um, but when you look at the data, uh, when you look at the actual number of professors who have lost their jobs or otherwise been targeted at Harvard, there's no question it finished dead last. Now, in terms of the schools that actually did finish last, Harvard got a negative score. Um, we rounded them up to a zero. It's, it was the first time in, fi in fire history that someone actually got a negative score. University of Pennsylvania came second to last. University of South Carolina, third to last. Interest well, that was interesting to us. Georgetown, fourth to last. Um, so Ivy League did terribly in general. Some schools did a little better than others, but for the most part, you're going to find tremendous talent and people who know how to disagree with each other at some of these schools that are, that are less well known. And I think one of the things that's a sign of the health of Michigan Technological University is they had an almost one-to-one -one ratio of people uh, in terms of political alignment. They actually had liberals and conservatives going to school together, which led to a comparatively healthy um, situation for respecting people you disagree with. Uh, are, next question. Are there any examples of, or well-known examples of people who've actually been uh, canceled and recovered? Because you talked about not firing quickly, it's almost harder for someone to not be fired and have to interact with that same group for a extended period of time. So, yeah, actually, there there are good good examples of people um, being canceled and recovered, um, and actually, Barry Weiss is one of them. I mean, one of the one of the things that was interesting about Barry was that uh, you know people were, she, and the funny thing about Barry is that she's. And I, 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 I know the political, um, like what actually makes you a liberal or conservative in terms of the American distribution really well. Barry Weiss is a moderate. Um, she is center, center, right. And she, after James Bennett was forced out of the New York Times in the summer of 2020, uh, she saw her number was up and she left. But she started up a company called The Free Press. Um, it's doing really well. Uh, it, it's becoming the, this kind of uh, little powerhouse. So she's turned into an entrepreneur uh, who, who's doing extremely well. In comedy, in a lot of cases, attempts to cancel, uh, uh, comedians have really backfired. And in the latest book, Canceling of the American Mind, I, we talk about comedy as probably being the most resilient and where the best hope is at the moment, that uh, you know, a Chris Rock or a Dave Chappelle, for example, are actually doing well uh, since there were, uh, e e not even in spite of, but in some cases because there were attempts to, to sort of end their career. But I have seen people, of course, who are less well known, who didn't have a big following, where it's been very hard, including my friend Mike who killed himself. Um, and including, uh, there, there was a, uh, someone, uh, a, a principal in Canada, for example, who was canceled and uh, who killed himself only in the past several months. So it can go very badly, but there are some really inspiring stories as well. So great question. So, so um, obviously much of your content focuses on what's happening in our higher, uh, uh, institutions of learning, yeah. but really it's a societal issue. Um, in your studies, uh, is this uniquely an American issue more so than other countries, number one? And number two, fast forward 20 years, how do we move away from the tribal environment that we seem to be in today? Wow, those are two great questions. Um, all of the research that me and John Haidt have done, and also Gene Twangy and a couple other people, indicate that these kind of ideological problems are facing the entire English-speaking world, um, which we find pretty fascinating, which is one of the reasons why, in, in coddling the American mind, we actually think that a lot of it are due to pre-existing trends sped up by the introduction of social media. That, that's a big part of the theory of why it's happening. Um, and I think why not as much in some other cultures? We think that some other cultures have greater inoculation against some of the aspects of things like cancel culture. They have institutions that actually bring people together to talk across lines of difference. Um, Germany, interestingly enough, there's a great book called Actung Baby that talks about how 
because of its totalitarian history, it actually now places a heavy emphasis on childhood independence, which leads to a lot of institutions that let kids meet each other from all over the country really early and get to be actual friends with each other. Um, so I do think that some countries have better inoculation against it. Now, where are we gonna be in 20 years? Um, that's hard to say because I think that we're seeing a political realignment happening right now, um, and you never know how that's actually gonna end up. Um, I think that the next 10 years are probably gonna be politically very tumultuous. I think there's gonna have to be, if we wanna, <laughs> not to make it sound too grave, but stay together as a country, we're going to have to learn how to meet people from different economic backgrounds than we grew up in, from different regions than we grew up in, and that has to be a priority. I haven't seen the desire for that kind of reform in some of the most problematic universities in the country, but I have seen it in, in, in um, which are, tend to be elite colleges, but I have seen other places being trying to be shine, beacons of this. Uh, Purdue University has tried very hard to buck the trend. But it can't just be higher ed. I, I, think, I think in some ways, some of the things that could actually help the most are less expensive, high rigor ways that people in, uh, can do K through 12, can do higher education, where a kid from a background like me, I was poor as a kid, could actually not face the idea of going $70,000 in debt for every year of a particular school, um, where they could actually show uh, you know, how much they've read, how hardworking they are, with having to go into huge amounts of debt. So I, I think that there are a lot, I, I actually put a lot of my hope in um, innovative technologies, but I also think we have to societally innovate. I think that people are going to college with way too little life experience. I think it would, we'd be living in a much healthier society if it was the norm that people didn't go straight to college, that they you know, uh, graduate from high school, and then they work for two years. I honestly think that would do wonders for our ability to talk, talk across lines of difference and a lot of these ideological problems that we're, that we're currently seeing. But, um, so one third of the book, Canceling the American Mind, is devoted to potential solutions. We talk about everything from parenting to what corporations can do, which is what I'm talking about here. Uh, principles for K through 12 reform and higher education reform. But I think we need to be thinking big, bold, and experimenting a lot. Next, okay. Next question. Oh, oh over there. Okay. Actually, yeah. I'll sure. go while that person's wait. Oh. I think you mentioned yeah, that- you, can, you guys can just talk. If I you think you to. mentioned that people can, uh, yeah, you could determine who might start a cancel. Uh, within your firm, can you give us some ideas as to how you can separate people who may just have different ideas from those who may launch an attack? Yeah, that, that can be a little bit hard. Um, I mean, at FIRE, we're a free speech organization, so we, we ask people questions about like, you know, is there speech you wouldn't defend? You know, and we, and we try to give like real world examples, like, like would you be uncomfortable defending a Trump supporter? Would you be uncomfortable uh, uh, defending a Biden supporter? Like, we, 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 and we try to make them as vivid as possible. So honestly, a little bit of, of, of basic questions about what they're, uh, you know, when was the last time you had a good discussion across a line of political difference? Like do, you, uh, like, do you still talk to your uncle that you disagree with? There are ways to get at it, and if, you, and, and if the impression you get is that this is someone who immediately cuts people off if they disagree with them, that could be a counselor that you potentially could be hiring. If, if instead they say, it's like, you know, I'm real far left or real far right, but, you know, like I hang out all the time. My best friend since I was th three is someone who votes for an entirely different candidate. Um, you know, then you don't have to worry nearly as much about, uh, about that. So I think in a lot of cases, people who, you know, really value their friends and family they disagree with are people you don't have to worry about. People who immediately cut off people that they just politically disagree with could create some really big problems for you. Hey, Greg. Hey, yeah. So I just wanted to say I read your book when I was a senior at UF. And oh, so man. I'm very excited. Trying to make me feel old. Well, that was just a few years ago, so <laughs> I'm very excited to be here. Um, and this is a little bit of an open-ended question, so I don't mean to run the clock too long, but sure. I wanted to know what you thought the true historical catalyst was for this cancel culture. That's a great question. Um, and like good scholars in coddling of the American mind, we come up with six causal factors, uh, and we added a seventh um, in, uh, uh, in the book. 
uh, and, and we added a seventh after the book. I do think that a lot of it is a combination of argumentative tactics that were very effective in higher education, that were very good at winning arguments in dorms, sort of coming down to younger people um, through K through 12 education, and then finding an absolutely perfect home in social media. And one thing that, that, that was really fun about writing Canceling of the American Mind is I got to write it with an absolutely brilliant Gen Z young woman named Ricky Schlott, who I first met when she was 20. She's now 23. Um, and when I talk about cancel culture beginning in 2014, um, that's what I mean by that is that's when society found out about this habit of, wow, I'm really going to ruin this dude's life who just said something I don't like, and I'm going to make sure that they're, they're fired and they never work again. Uh, she always makes the point, but I grew up with it um, because a lot of the tactics and techniques for pile, like everything from pylons to virtue signaling to figuring out a way to bully someone while also looking like you're the most virtuous person were tactics that were perfected in junior high schools. And this, it was one of those things I, I kind of thought about that in the abstract, but it was much different to write a book with someone who actually grew up with this and people tried to cancel when she was in junior high school. And I'm like, oh my God, okay, so this, this argument of technology that's incredibly effective at winning, our, we, we call this winning arguments without winning arguments. You don't persuade anybody else, but you scare that person out of disagreeing with you or you ruin their lives. That's the nature of cancel culture. It's essentially, it's, a, it, it's one of many tactics to win arguments without persuading anybody, winning arguments without winning arguments. But she, you know, she helped me understand that, yes, of course it works. Things that succeed get repeated. And what this means is we're all essentially arguing like junior high schoolers now in a very literal way. I think the fever is breaking a little bit at the moment. I think there's a little bit of kind of like when someone's he decides, like, let's go ruin this person's life. There's a little bit more, like, really, we're still doing this thing? So, so I think that, that, that it's not sustainable, and I think that the younger generation, now this is an interesting stat that should give you, give you hope. The younger, the, the, the group that hates cancel culture the most, according to, to stats, is actually Gen Z. Hate it more than uh, even the oldest uh, oldest generations of the United States. So that gives me hope. That gives her hope. But I do think it's a it's a confluence of, you know, I, I had something that was just too nerdy. But um, Richard Dawkins refers to why genes propagate as the uh, as the selfish gene. That essentially it's as if genes want to progress through. Basically, genes use us as their devices to to propagate themselves. And he also, Richard Dawkins also developed the term meme. And I think of cancel culture as like the selfish meme. It, it's so successful, it just keeps propagating itself and it won't keep, uh, it won't stop propagating itself to people put their foot down and say, listen, I don't think you should fire that pizza guy. I don't think this person should lose their job because they cracked a joke 10 years ago. And I can see that happening a little bit um, but I hope that uh, we can actually finally learn some, of, uh, learn some of these lessons and show, you know, some greater grace and compassion towards people we disagree with or people who we all know, in some cases, wh when they're getting canceled, did things as st ju just as dumb as we did when we were in high school. They just, uh, somehow ours didn't get out. So I do think that there is some hope on the cancel culture front, uh, culturally speaking. And I think I probably have time for, oh, maybe one more question? Uh, is there anybody? Okay. It's also drink time. <laughs> Thank you.